Today, we're beginning a book that is not so much about understanding as it's a book that you experience. It's a book that speaks of deep and profound mysteries, and it speaks of the human condition. Um, interestingly enough, it asks great questions, but it gives very few answers. It's a book that will resonate with you on the deepest level and then leave you deeply frustrated. It's a book that um, is the oldest book we have in the Bible. That is to say, it was the one that almost certainly was written first. Um, but it also is one of the earliest books written in all of human history. It is a book that is fundamental, foundational, most explanatory of what it means to be a human being and what it means to live in the human condition. The book we're looking at is the wisdom of Job. The wisdom of Job. So the question is, what do we make of this book of Job? This book that is the most human of all the books in the Bible. Well, this is the deal. You know, the book of Job is a book of wisdom. Now, it's super important that we understand what we mean by wisdom and that we understand this as a book of wisdom. That this is a book that teaches us the wise, the smart, the, the, the right way to live rather than a book of understanding. So, so it's a, a book of wisdom. Uh, much of it's written in, in prose. Most of it is written as poetry. And, and it's meant to resonate with us and guide us in what the wise way to live as a human being. So, so Job is a book of wisdom that helps us grapple with the questions of meaning in a world that is filled with profound pain, suffering, and deep loss. And so Job was given the very first thing that was written in, in, in trying to help us understand what does it mean to live in this world where so much heavy goes on, where we can look at the furthest corners of the world. And if something tragic were to happen in the next hour, we could know about it in minutes on our phone with graphic detail. If, if, if something happens in our country and we can see it, we, we become aware of it and we grieve it. And, and here's the deal about this, this issue of pain and suffering. The closer it gets to us, the more real it becomes. And, and so it's in our region or something tragic happens in our town or a hospital closes in our town or, or, or difficulty happens in our town. It becomes even more profound. And then when it affects our family, when a loss is felt personally, so that we can smell it and taste it and feel it, and, and it's personal, even if so much of the world isn't even aware of it. How are we supposed to respond? What does wisdom look like in the midst of this kind of human experience? Now, this is the deal. Job is a story, okay? And we're going to talk about what Job lost in the story. But the temptation with the book of Job is to look at it and say, oh man, that Job... He had a rough, rough road, okay? And to separate ourselves from him, or, or to look say, that Job, I know someone who went through something really bad. That must be the Job thing. But here's what you need to understand about the book of Job. The book of Job is your story. And it's my story. It's, 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 it's the story of the human condition. So, so the story of Job is a story of loss, okay? It's a story of, of what happens when, when, when tragedy hits. And, and just understand, in the human condition, okay, Job's story eventually becomes all of our story because a huge part of what it means to be human is to experience loss. And a huge part of what it means to live in the human story is to figure out what is the wise way to live when loss happens, when answers are not clear to the questions that we have. So let's talk a little bit about the story of Job. So the story of Job starts, and, and, and let me just say a couple things about how we're going to approach Job. A couple things. One is we're doing the book of Job in four weeks, okay? It's 47 chapters. Don't worry, I'll talk fast. Um, 
We'll get through a lot. Um, but, but here's the deal. In order for you to get the most out of it, you need to participate in this with us. So we've got some amazing devotions that you can get, and, and they are connected with our Right Now Media video curriculums, and, and they're also connected to our Dwell app. So over the next four weeks, I want to invite you to journey through the book of Job to experience the book of Job as we go through it. And, and I think it'll be a deeply profound invitation and an invitation to understand how to respond with wisdom in this life. The other thing I want you to know about how we're going to go through Job is I'm going to spend less time on what a lot of people who teach Job spend more time on. That is to say, a lot of people focus on the story. I'm going to be focusing on the meaning of Job. So, so one of the things people get hung up on with, it's kind of an interesting story where, where God is holding court, okay? And we wonder, what's that all about? And people wonder about the reality of that, and the, con, um, the, the, co- the cosmology of that. And, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that. I'm going to talk about it to some level on the podcast we do every week, so if you're a podcaster, you do the podcast, we'll talk about it there. But, but understand that, 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 that we're not going to talk a ton about God's court and what that means. And, and one day he's in court, and this is the story. Um, uh, he has different uh, heavenly beings coming before him, and one of the beings who come before him is Satan. And immediately we say, how does that work and all that? We're not going to talk about that. Because what, what's being described here is an antagonistic relationship between God's perspective and Satan's perspective, between the tempter and the redeemer, between, between the one who is trying to tear down and the one who is trying to build up. And so all of that is set up. And so God says to Satan in the story, he says, have you considered my servant Job? He says he's a person of integrity, he worships, he does what is right, he's a righteous person. And Satan says to God, well, yeah, that's only because you protect him and you bless him. He's only, you know, skin for skin. I mean, he's just someone who, who, who's, bl- who's, who's blessing you because you've blessed him. And so God says, okay, well, take away his stuff. Bring suffering upon him. And then this, this tragedy starts coming upon Job. He, he loses his, his house. He loses his, his wealth. He loses his sons and daughters. Okay, he loses his standing in the community. He, he loses this incredible loss. And, and then, and, and yet in the midst of it, it says Job did not sin against God. He held on to his integrity. And then, and then Satan comes back and, and God says, look at my servant Job. He's, he's doing exactly what I said he would do. And then Satan says, yeah, that's only because you haven't touched him. If you, if you, you make it personal, if you take away his health, well, then, then he will curse you, okay? And so, so he says, go ahead. And so what ends up happening is Job becomes covered in sores and boils and at the, the end of the first chapters of Job, what you have is you have Job literally on the ash heap of his life, having lost everything, and, and this is the story of Job. And the question is, is when tragedy happens, when loss hits us, how do we respond? What is the path of wisdom in this? Now again, this is not a, story, a book that's going to explain why bad things happen, okay? If you're looking for that book, there are other books, the Bible, other books that speak to those kinds of things, but this is not this book. This is a book about how to respond when you have questions that do not have good answers. In fact, one of the strongest warnings in this book is a warning about giving simple answers to complicated problems, to assigning meaning in very simplistic ways to things that are way above our understanding. It's a story about loss. Let's talk about what Job lost. And as we go through this, I just want to ask you to have the courage to feel what you have lost. To have the courage to be honest about about those things in your life that you thought were there Going to be good that just aren't. So what did Job lose? First thing he would is he lost his wealth. So, so what does it mean to lose your wealth? Well, it, it, it's a loss of the illusion that you are in control. That you have enough stuff, that you have enough competence, you have created enough around yourself, you've bought enough insurance that nothing can really hurt you. And to have that taken away is, is shattering. It can be the loss of a job. It can be a, a stock market class, crash. It can be the closing of a business. It can be a betrayal of a business you thought was going to go well, but you got on the wrong end and someone took advantage of you. It can be a loss of this kind of economic security that we think makes us secure. Job lost his wealth. What else did Job lose? Job also lost his family. And I have to admit, this is the one that is my Achilles heel. 
I mean, uh, of all the things that make me feel vulnerable, there's nothing that makes me feel vulnerable like my family. I mean, when I was young, I was Teflon. I did crazy things. I thought nothing could hurt me. I was the guy who jumped off of rocky cliffs into roaring waters, floating down rivers where there were signs warning. I, I just, nothing could hurt me. And I thought even that, you know, no matter what happens, I'm going to go for it because nothing can hurt me. And then I had children. And this little helpless thing was thrust upon me. And, and, and I never felt what I felt there, this overwhelming love and sense of crushing responsibility. And my first thought in getting this child was, I have to provide and protect for this thing. Nothing bad can happen to this thing. And, 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 and I, I, I had this, this deep, just desire to, to, to have this child go through life and, and just protect him from anything that would hurt him. But the problem is, that's not the human experience. That no matter what I do, no matter what I try to provide for, no matter how I try to do this, this child is going to experience pain and loss and struggle and difficulty. That's why very quickly you need to change the narrative from protection to preparation for how they can go through their losses, their pains, their struggling with wisdom. Because so often what we want to do is we either want to be snowplow parents, that we, we plow everything out of their way, make it as easy as possible, we rob them of the dignity of their own struggle, or we become helicopter parents, where we just hang upon them so we can drop in and save the day every time they get a bad grade or every time they have a bully or anytime something goes through. And, and we don't realize that we think we're protecting them, but what we're really doing is we're, we're not protecting them, we're not preparing them. So, so you have this child, and, and when anything ha bad happens to them, that hurts me worse than anything happens to me. Well, the, the people came and they said, Job, you lost all your wealth, all your, your stuff. And then they started coming and saying, all your sons and daughters were there together, and they're all gone now. They all died. And, and this was Job, who was deeply invested in his parents. One of the stories in the early part in Job is that his sons and daughters would get together and they would have feasts together. And the next day, Job would offer, offer a sacrifice on their behalf just in case they did something wrong. Okay? So Job knew what it was to constantly be trying to watch out, be preparing, trying to protect the kids. And now they're gone. You know, there are a lot of ways we can lose our kids. We obviously can lose our kids tragically to death. And when that happens to families, that is a pain and a mark that is beyond anything we understand. And, and, and it's deeply painful. But other ways we lose our kids is we can lose our kids to immorality and, and behaviors that are self-destructive that, that can lead to even addictions. We can lose our kids to ideologies in this world that will turn them against the things that we value most deeply that makes it hard to even have a relationship with them. We can lose them relationally to, to other people and other things. And when we lose our kids, it is a devastating thing. How do we choose the path of wisdom when that happens? In addition to this, Job lost his reputation. You say, what do you mean by this? Well, Job's reputation was he was a winner. I mean, he was the rich guy with a great family, beautiful wife, had it all together. He was just living large. He was Job. And when he looks, that's what righteousness does. That's what a good life, that's how it's supposed to pay off. Because, because he, he's winning because he's doing the right thing. Now, here's one of the things you learn, is that when you've got it all together and things are going great, and all of a sudden they're not, okay, what comes in is a narrative of shame. It comes in this thing that says, oh, man, I wonder what they did wrong. I wonder what happened to them. I, I wonder why they're off. I'm, I'm not a winner anymore. One of the things, this is particularly true for men, that makes dealing with loss so very difficult is, is that when we lose, and all of a sudden went to a point of strength, to weakness, and our identity, our image of the person who has it all together, and all of a sudden we don't have it all together, when that gets shattered, one of the biggest feelings we feel, particularly men, is embarrassment. We go, listen, no, 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 this is not who I am. I'm not a person who needs help, I'm a person who gives help. I'm the person who has it together, who looks down on people who don't have it together. I'm the one who gives the hand up, not the one who needs the hand up. And when we become vulnerable in our loss, our reputation, our image, our self-image gets lost. Not only that, his framework for reality got lost. Because his framework was, you know what? This is the way it's going to be. You see, we don't realize... We make contracts with God that God doesn't sign. Okay, this is one of the things that we have come to believe that are 
it's the great myth of our, 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 our humanity that, that we've come to believe that, that we thought was going to be the case. We, we actually feel entitled to this, and we are horrified when it doesn't happen. This is the thing we've come to believe, okay? The, the myth that we think. Things will always be as they are now. And then they change. And then they get blown up. The person's not there. The dream dies. The opportunity changes. All of a sudden, things are different. And we just kind of say to ourselves, how could this change? I just thought it was going to be like this. And my expectations were this. And now there's this. And we say to God, God, we signed a contract that if I do good things, then good things are going to happen. And I did good things and bad things happen. God, we signed a contract that I said if I raise my kids in a certain way, you would make it so that they turn out in this certain way. And that didn't happen. God, you, 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 we signed a contract that if I did the honorable and right thing in business and community and I played by the rules, then it would go all right, and it didn't. And now I don't know what the rules are. I, I used to think of myself as the winner, and now I feel like a loser. And I don't know where to stand and what I can count on and what's real. And reality just becomes shaken. What's real? Who are you? Who am I in the midst of this? In addition to this, he lost his wife. Now, this is really an interesting thing. It makes you wonder about Job's wife, actually. Because the devil's thinking, how can I torment Job? Take away his family, take away his health, take away his w uh, riches, leave his wife. I'm going to leave that there for a minute. <laughs> Maybe it says something about her, but maybe it says something about what the devil knows he can do when our primary relationships get broken. Because I have a lot of compassion for Job's wife. We're going to see more about her. She loses everything. And she goes down a path of despair that Job can't go. And Job goes down a path, a different path, that she can't go. And now because of the tragedy, they can't find each other. And that relationship, and I wonder if this wasn't the most painful part for him, isn't there. And, and there's all kinds of times where we thought we had a friendship or a relationship or a marriage or this or that, and we thought it was going to be there, and now it's gone. It's part of a loss. What does wisdom look like in that kind of a loss? And then he loses his health. I'll tell you what, when I was young, I thought I could do anything. I was going to live forever. You know, I just rubbed some dirt on it. I'm getting older now. Things hurt. Standing up is a thing, you know? <laughs> Driving the car, you get, I'm sore, what'd you do? I put on pants. <laughs> you know, and then if you actually go through something where you had to have a surgery, or you got a especially bad uh, illness, or you went to do something you always used to be able to do and you can't do it anymore, that is destabilizing, that is unnerving, it is inevitable, right? The Apostle Paul says, Outwardly, we're wasting away. Inwardly, we're being renewed. I get the first part, you know, that, that this thing, it's, it's a loss of certainty and, and, and it creates anxiety that, that I'm not young and I'm not vital and, and, and it's probably going to go the other way, not the other way. And, and, and that's an unsettling thing. It's a, a loss and, and a source of grief. And, and ultimately, he also lost God. You say, what do you mean he lost God? He lost God as he understood it. You see, you get the uh, idea of the theological landscape from these friends who are going to come back to Job. We're going to discover them in the next couple weeks. But these friends from Job are great, great, great friends. They are great, great, great friends until they start to talk. So they come to Job. Job's in the ashes. They sit with Job in those ashes for seven days. They just sit there with them. They're present. They're aware, they're loving, they got no opinions, that's friendship, and then they open their mouths. And it starts going downhill from there. And they are the ones at the end of the book who ends up in trouble. Job, by the way, never gets in trouble in this book with God, okay? He questions, he screams, he yells, he's honest. He is the epitome of wisdom in this book. So whatever it is that Job did is meant to be understood by us as the wise thing to do. Okay? Job's friends are the ones who feel it necessary to defend themselves because they're insecure, defend God because they're insecure about their belief in God. They have a simplistic theology, and their theology is very simple. It's this. It's do good things, good things happen. If you do good, you will get the exact amount of goodness you deserve. Consequently, do bad things, and bad things happen. 
So if something bad has happened to you, very simplistic, causal relationship, exact retribution, exact reward. And so Job, you know what? Bad things are happening. Who's to blame? Maybe it was your kids. Maybe it was your wife. Probably was you, Job. Here's some shame. Here's some things. It's the biblical principle that is a proverb that you reap what you sow, that they make an exact representation of it. And when they do that, they have a very small view of God. One of the things that is a great point of wisdom coming out of Job is that when we go through our losses in wisdom, God becomes bigger. God becomes bigger. He becomes more central, less understood, but bigger. And so here's Job in the midst of all this, losing and losing and losing. What losses have you experienced? What losses? Are you the tough guy who denies it, rubs some dirt on I'm fine? Are you the person who goes quiet and pushes it inside? Are you the person who, you know, just embodying bitterness and it just comes out sideways in your relationship? How you deal with your losses is the key to being a wise human, a a smart human, a well-adjusted human, and Job sets the template for us to understand this. Let's talk a little bit about this, okay? And understand this, that Job's story is an example of what happens all the time. I had a friend, a a fellow pastor, and and this pastor, uh, she was talking about just how difficult she had with the problem of Job. She said, I can't believe God did that to Job. And she said, "I, I just have to either not deal with that book or explain it away as an allegory or something like that. But she just can't imagine God would do that. And I just pointed out to to her, I just said, you know, here's the problem with that approach to this whole conversation about, about Job is Job's story happens all the time. So even if you let God off the hook for Job, what about the rest of human history? It doesn't solve the problem because Job's story is an example of what happens all the time to all of us eventually at some level. Job's story is the human condition. This idea that in life, things change, things are lost, there is pain, there is struggling, there is difficulty, that is the way it is. And it doesn't have to do with, if I'm good, I can avoid that. If I'm bad, I get more of that. Those are simplistic, childish, inadequate ways to deal with with the reality of loss and pain and suffering in the human story. Let's take a look at at, at, at this. What Job is trying to teach us is that what we want when we are hurting is understanding. We want knowledge. What that is, it's the best and most reliable uh, information we need. So we want to open the book of Job. We want to read these bad things to happen to Job. And then Job questioned God, and God says, Okay, Job, let me explain why this happened. Let me explain my whole plan. Let me explain everything that's going on. Let me explain depths about myself and reality that there's no way you're going to understand. Because we get this idea, if I could just understand, I could deal with it. Now, here's what you just understand. We need to understand about understanding. If understanding is what we would have needed, God would give it to us. But apparently, we need something else. What we need is wisdom. So wisdom is not about what we intellectually understand. Wisdom is that which makes us the kind of people we become and the way we respond when we don't have all the answers. Wisdom is our response when we don't understand. Wisdom is our response when we don't have answers. How are we going to respond when all of us have that inevitable appointment with uncertainty, with loss, with pain, with difficulty? You see, here's the deal. If we just received understanding... There's two problems. The first problem is, if we got the understanding without the wisdom that comes through experience, we would get what the Apostle Paul calls the knowledge that puffs up rather than the love that builds up. Because the wisdom of going through pain makes us empathetic, compassionate, loving people when we do it wisely. Okay, that's not always the case because sometimes we just get bitter. Okay? But if we just received understanding, we'd be lecturing, we'd be Job's friends all over the place, okay? The other problem is, in order to understand the vast depths and mysteries of God, we need to be the kind of people who have grown and be significant enough to begin to take in all that God is and doing and meaning and significance and metaphysics and things that are way beyond our pay grade. And so we don't have the capacity for the understanding that we think we want. What we are given in the book of Job is a path of wisdom, a way of living and thinking and being, okay? So let's talk about 
these three paths just to kind of set this up for the stage and the work we're going to be doing over the next month. The first path we could take is the path of despair. And this is where Job's wife comes in. So Job's on the ash heap of his life, literally sitting on a bunch of ashes, ashes covered in sores, nobody there, all alone, everything's lost, miserable. And then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Do you hold fast to, to holding it all together? Because the opposite of integrity is, is to disintegrate, is to fall apart, is to give up in despair, is to throw God away. He, and, and she says, are you still holding on to that? And listen to her advice. I love you, honey, and we're going to get through this together. <laughs> That's not exactly where she went. Curse God and die. Curse God and die. Out of her pain, out of her loss, she embraces a bitterness and despair. And I get it. I mean, don't you get it? Her children are gone. Her image is gone. Her identity is gone. She has lost her feet. We don't know what happens to her. Okay? Because I've been there where, where despair seems like the only reasonable response to this what's going on. Okay, and I will tell you, if there is one bumper sticker for the spirit of our age, it's this. I mean, if you want to talk about the fruit of postmodernism, the radical enlightenment, the new atheist movement, it's this. It's this idea that, you know what, this world is an empty empty, empty void of a thing. There is no God. It's all random chance. Nothing matters. Nothing's meaningful. It makes all kinds of sense because there's suffering and pain because you're just an accident of evolution. You are a speck on a planet that's a speck in a small little galaxy in a big giant universe that doesn't care at all for you. Good luck. Curse God and die. Just go for as much pleasure as you can get. Try to find some meaning in that and exploring or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's all meaningless. Curse God and die. We live in an age of despair. And people are wondering, why is there more anxiety than ever before? Why is there more depression than ever before? Okay, you're a meaningless speck on a speck of a speck. No one loves you. It's an empty void of a universe that could care less about you. Hey, cheer up. And in the light of the pain and the loss and the hurt that is the human condition, it's easy to embrace this kind of thing, particularly true of young people, to embrace this narrative of, of, of nothingness. By the way, this, this little spec thing, I had a young, young man, he had to be 19, 20 years old, come to me between service, and he said, that part really resonated with me because that's, that's what I'm swimming in, that's what I'm living in. He said, but you know... Um, I am that speck compared to God, but, but I'm, I'm like, uh, he and I talked, we're like, like, like a diamond. A diamond is a speck of a speck, but its value is what someone will pay for it. And look what God paid for me. It's not the size or the volume, it's that there's a God who values me in the middle of this. And he was just, he was just glowing, he just floated out of this place because God had met him and, 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 and turned him away from this message of despair, even in the midst of, of the law. So, so this is one of the pathways that you can walk. You can, you can walk the pathway of despair. This, by the way, is the opposite of worship. It's the opposite of worship. It's deep ingratitude. It's cursing of God. It's, it's toxic to your soul. It, it, it is a emotional release. That, that, that can rot your soul. It, it is the opposite of worship. Now, now the second response, uh, uh, look what Job responds. He says, but he said to her, you speak as one who is a foolish woman. Again, book of wisdom. This is a foolish response would speak. So, shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. At the end of it, he said, you know what? God brings good. God brings bad. bad. You know, it's still about God. We, we follow God not because he gives us good things. There's what the devil accused Job of. We follow God because he's God. And, and that's, that's the grounding principle of wisdom. And then he comes back. Remember who that was innocent. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, so, so the second path. That's the first path. Fair. Second path is the path to easy answers to mystery. Now, this is where Job's friends come in. 
Again, they had this theology of exact retribution, exact reward, that you do this little thing, good things happen. You do this bad thing, this thing. Simplistic answers. Well, this happened, so I guess God was trying to teach me this. Or this happens, so God was to teach you this. By the way, if you're like one of Job's friends and someone's going through a terrible tragedy, don't send him a link to this sermon. Just don't. And don't say something, well, I'm sure the Lord's going to teach you something, you know. Okay, that's a Job friend move. What, what's the best thing I can do for him then? Sit in the ashes and keep your mouth shut. Do whatever you can to communicate. You love them and you don't know, but you love them and you know God loves them and you're praying for them and it's awkward, it's hard, and you want to give them more and they want more and you don't have more to give, but you're there. That, that's, that's suffering with someone. That's friendship. That, that's rare. So, so simple answers to mystery. And, and what you're going to see about so much of the response of Job's friends, there are two things that I notice about it. One is, it's all shame-based. The second thing you're going to notice is how often you agree with them. I mean, this is the thing. I, I remember particularly as a young man, I'd read through Job and I'd be reading the friend's response because these friends feel like they need to defend God. God doesn't need to defend. You're saying some hard things about God, Job. Let me just say what the Lord would say. Okay, because what you're saying is making me feel uncomfortable, I, and I'm not real secure about what I believe and what's going on, and, and so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you have it. But they'll say things, you know, that, that look a lot like, well, they make a pretty good argument there. Well, that's a pretty good point. I think theologically that might be technically true, and, and I find myself agreeing with Job's friends, only to find at the end, God says that Job's friends couldn't be more wrong. He's angry at the end of this book, but not with Job. He's angry with the friends who presumed to think they understood the mind of God, the plan of God, and were way, way above their pay grade. Okay? There are mysteries more profound, more deep than we could understand. Now watch this in Job. This is the friend, okay? Job, remember who that was ever innocent uh, who perished. Can you remember anybody who was innocent? Everybody who died, they got what they deserved, okay? Or where were the upright cut off? Can you think of one example of someone who really was doing the right thing and they were cut off? No, 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 no. No one's righteous. Everyone's a sinner. All these kinds of things. As I have seen, those who plow in iniquity sow trouble and reap the same. And so they quote that biblical proverb that is in the Bible in another place. So they quote scripture at them. Whew. So here's the deal, dude. You can be quoting scripture and still be wrong. What? You saying the scripture's wrong? No, I'm saying you're wrong. And the way you're using scripture is wrong. Particularly when you use it like a club or harshly applied. You take a passage that is in essence a proverb and you make it a rule. Like you will reap what you sow. And that's what they do. Simple answers for complicated things. This happened so it must have been this. This happened so it must have been this. Or this bad thing happened, so you must be bad. Or this good thing happened to me, so I must be good. And it's amazing how gracious we are in the application for ourselves, and how harsh we are for others. Because here's the deal. When I do something wrong, it's a mistake. When you do it, it's a sin. Okay? When something bad happens to me, I'm a victim. When something bad happens to you, it's your fault. Okay? When something happened good to me, it's because I've worked hard, I've followed through, I've done the right thing, I I'm on top of my game. When something good happens to you, it's because you're getting what you don't deserve. Or someone else did something good, or maybe you finally got something right. You see, the, the harsh application, and all that is born from our own insecurity and our, our very small view of God. That's why I say, when we go through this in wisdom, God gets bigger. And eventually, we start seeing, like, I've got edges around my understanding of God. Only when you recognize that we have a God without edges, whose ways are above our ways, whose thoughts are above our thoughts, who has things that he wishes to show us and will show us as, we, as time and eternity plays out that are way beyond our capacity to understand. He is wild. He is more amazing. That's why the third response, and this is the response of Job, is wonder, worship, and meaning. It's seeing a God who is so much bigger than anything we could understand, who makes the pain, the suffering, and loss, something profound that he can redeem. He, he, he makes it a necessary part of our discovery of him and what it really means to be a human being. And so God uses these things in ways we can't even begin to understand. So this is Job when he answers. He says, Then Job arose and tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and worshipped. And worshipped. Okay, that's one thing he never stopped doing. Because he did not worship God because God brought good things to him. He worshiped God because God was God. 
No matter what God did to me, God is still God. Look at this. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb. I got nothing. And, and naked I shall return. Okay, I, I didn't earn anything. I don't have anything. It, it, it just he, he puts himself in proper perspective. He frames wisdom of understanding himself in God in such a way that he can now receive from God. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, no matter which situation I'm in. And in all this, look at this, Job did not sin or charge God with any wrong. And so in the midst of this, God, he never said to God, God, you're horrible, curse you, turn away, you're all these kinds of things. He might have felt, he might have suspected it. And that doesn't mean he doesn't question God. Because we're going to see next week, he says, God, I got some questions. And, and I'm asking these questions not because, you know, I'm angry, I'm just spitting them at you. I'm asking them because I believe you are who you say you are. And there are answers to these questions. So I'm going to lift them up and it's going to express my heart and my emotions and my, my lament and the things that just don't sit right with me. I'm going to bring them all to you. And this is the path of wisdom. At the end of the book, jumping forward 42 chapters, this is what Job comes to, okay? Therefore. So what's therefore? Therefore, because of everything that's come before, okay? Because of what God just said, and we're going to look at God's answer in a couple, because God does answer, and the answer is awe-inspiring, amazing, mind-blowing, and completely unsatisfying. If you want understanding, because it's offering something more important than understanding, It's offering meaning. It's offering a profound view of God. Now watch this. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. So again, not way above my pay grade. I did not understand. I still don't understand. Okay? Things too wonderful for me. A God who is bigger, a reality that's more profound, existential in glory, in beauty, metaphysical, and just beyond anything I could even begin to conceive of. Ask the questions. I don't even understand the questions. Get answers. I'm not ready for that. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. This interesting word, know, whenever you see it in the scriptures almost all the time, is it's a word that mixes limited understanding with profound experience. So we talk about, I know what intimacy is. I make love to my wife. Both are knowing, but profoundly different. Okay, there's a knowing, there's an experience that is the seed of wisdom. And if what we needed was just simple answers to complicated questions, I guess God would have sent them. But he obviously said you need something else to be everything that humanity is going to be. And not only is it going to be played out in the book of Job, because all the book of Job really does is get us to a point that we can start receiving the answers. We can start experiencing the reality. And it plays out in other places in the scriptures. And spoiler alert, it culminates in the suffering of Jesus. We're going to see that here in a couple weeks. It's prophesied in the book of Job. Okay? It, it, it becomes this incredibly meaningful thing that is still layered with mystery. Because we're talking about the God without edges. How could we possibly claim to understand that? And, and so Job is, is the place where we discover that. So what is Job? It's an invitation to wonder. That there is a God, a God in the mystery. God is the mystery that is bigger than any pain, loss, or suffering. We're going to discover that together. So here's some next steps for you, okay? Next steps is, you know, grab the devotion this week. Pick it up at the Gathering Center. Use your app. Go online. It's connected again with a study online. It's connected again with the Dwell app where you're going to just listen a few chapters every day um, 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 throughout this month to the book of Job. And, and don't try to understand it nearly as much as you experience it, you feel it, you resonate with it. And there are going to be times you're saying, Job, that's a good question. That's exactly what I feel. That's exactly what I'm going through. And, and connect with your pain. I'm going to call you to have the courage to get close to your loss because some of you have been pushing it off. Some of you have been denying it. Some of you just got your head down, you're going. Some of you are isolating. Some of you are medicating. Some of you are drinking. Some of you are shopping. You're denying it. That is not the path of wisdom. That's the path of denial. It's the path of despair. But to get close to it, we're going to talk about that next week, lament. Man, that's the challenge. To have the courage to understand what wisdom looks like to go through what is the human condition, those deep and profound losses that touch each one of our life. So let's pray together. Um, Father, I want to start by praying for any person here today 
who this message just landed on because they have had some deep and profound loss in their life, particularly related to our kids. Father God, I just pray you meet them right now. You get them the courage to, to bring their loss to you. If it comes with hurt and anger and accusation, it comes with questions, give them the courage to trust you enough to just bring those things to you. I pray, Father God, that you will meet each one of us in this next month, that as we look at the wisdom of Job, we would see a pathway to, for you to become bigger in our life, for you to become um, more in our life, for you to become more than an answer, for you to become the mystery that puts everything into the context of meaning. God, I just pray that you will meet us in the midst of this. Thank you for this book, this ancient book that could not be more relevant to this moment right here in this place. Give us the wisdom to enter in, to read, to study, to think, to feel, and to process all of this, trusting that you are the good God who will be with us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.